good evening everybody today we have uh, uh, another episode of epidemic watch talk series and today we have a speaker uh, professor chandri who is uh, a professor in medicine at government medical college calicut uh, professor chandri had a very illustrious career uh, and uh, many uh, uh, many awards uh, including uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, memberships in national and international bodies including being a governing body member of the hypertension society of india and the secretary of the association of physicians india kerala chapter uh, she is also the vice chairman of the rscsbi kerala chapter she has also fantastic set of research in the area of diabetes and diabetes management um i'll not extend further uh, we are all proud as students of uh, professor chandni uh, she has been a favorite teacher during my medical school years uh, thank you and uh, the floor is all yours madam Thank you, Vinod. Uh, good evening, everybody. I am really thankful for giving me this opportunity to present. Uh, as uh, the title says, experiences and learning from the Nipah virus outbreak in Kerala. I am thankful to Dr. Vinod and all those who are working behind Epidemic Watch for this. big opportunity as it says i have been involved in nipa management in 2018 i was along with the team in 2018 2019 in kochi and 2021 again we had in september 2021 in calicut so that has given us a lot of uh, understanding new learnings and that too before covid 19 that is 2018 we were we had the experience before covid 19 so when i talk about uh, nipa our experiences i cannot uh, forget sister lini who passed away after coming in contact with uh, covid 19 patient and the who paid homage to her uh, during that time and uh, in fact she was awarded by the uh, our vice president she was awarded national florence nightingale nurses award in 2019 along with uh, sister shobana sister shobana is our infection control nurse and she was the team leader during that time in infection control management and in organizing and coordinating the activities in 2018 so that is uh, very very important as far as an infection like nipa is concerned so we know that uh, as per who 2021 the priority diseases we have a long list now from covid 19 to disease x and today we will be discussing more about nipa and henipa viral diseases and this is all the more important because during covid 19 we had an outbreak in 24 september 2021 in india in calicut so plan of my presentation is i'll be taking you through about the outbreaks overview management concerns that we have faced infection control practices adopted lessons learned long term sequelae in the survivors and way forward outbreaks are not unusual as far as uh, most of us where we practice today but a possible zoonotic outbreak with high human human transmission and high mortality was more challenging at 2018 outbreak at kolkot and that has taught us that we has to have more of preparedness in such situations which we were hardly having at that point of time and this was occurred in a new geographic area in india that was the importance of nipa in 2018 at calicut and all the more we had the outbreak identified and uh, system was uh, declared as uh, nipa outbreak was uh, announced by that time we had already confirmed six patients were died and every day most of the days there were death happening and that was really frightening for the system in and those who are in the management plan so this was the situation in may 2018 and in may 2019 we had only one patient that was at kochi and later september 2021 again we had another patient but it was more challenging because it happened during the outbreak of covid-19 we know that how much the system was stressed because of the covid-19 strategies and activities that was happening in the healthcare system 
our institution is uh, one among eight hospital complexes and it is a tertiary care center and this one building was a uh, bed strength of 325 and it caters to the healthcare needs of five districts and this all happened on a day with an ed turnover average 500 to 800 and we have an average 191000 patients in 2017 this is only to show that the huge number of patients uh, attached to the system and uh, in 18 May 2018, Calicut, all, all of us know that it's a coastal uh, city with uh, uh, beaches and alva and chips, but all on a sudden the city deserted because of the announcement of the Nipah outbreak and that has caused death in more people than expected in any other disease. So the primary case happened in 5th May 2018. It was a 26 year old male coming to came to us with high grade fever, headache, vomiting, altered sensorium. He was febrile, drowsy, tachypnic. He was managed in a busy emergency department and diagnosed to have ARDS and encephalitis and he expired on the same day. And the diagnosis put was viral encephalitis and it was not unusual to have a viral encephalitis. And in 2017, we had about 134 cases of viral encephalitis. And uh, we had 19 deaths, and in 2018, 154 cases, 20 deaths, and among them, five was Japanese encephalitis and 12 Nipah. And uh, 12 Nipah means the confirmed cases, excluding the uh, primary case as well. And uh, 10 of them died in our hospital. So this is the statistics. But I, I think in most of the situations, even if uh, uh, facilities are available, 40 50 percent or more may be undiagnosed as far as viral encephalitis is considered. But this was not very important. But after two weeks, three family members were affected with the same illness. So that was rather unusual. And uh, one 32-year-old female near from the nearby district also presented to us with ARDS and myocarditis. And with this clustering, the system got alerted on the same date. And the samples were, were uh, analyzed in Manipal Center for Virology and Research Institute. And it was identified as a dangerous virus and NYV confirms the research and outbreak was declared on 20th, 5th, May, 2018. What is more important was uh, though there was no previous experience, the response was instantaneous at institutional level, that is at the medical college level and at the public health level. The strategies implemented were isolation facility, ICU care, 24 into 7 control room and district level co-committee and state team. And to add and support, we had a multidisciplinary central team also, because it was rather unusual and unexpected for a uh, district, which was very, very new to us. And seven steps to fight NIV that was in the beginning itself, that was to infection control practices, proper PPE by healthcare workers, because it was rather new in 2018, but it may not appear so new after COVID-19 because all of us are familiar with the adequate and appropriate PPE and 95 mask and everything. But it was very unusual and uncommon practice at that point of time. Housekeeping practices, staff health monitoring, because staff also were affected, two of our nurses were affected so we had one from the other hospital and one of the patient was from one healthcare worker from our own institution who survived so that was also important visitor for visitors policy was uh, has to be changed safe collection and handling of samples transportation of samples as well as a protocol for handling disease so all these things has to be done in a short time and this was a period of continuous learning and it has actually a practice change for us. So this was 2018. I put it with so fondly because it was something that we never knew how to do with all sorts of PPE and other things. And this was a training that has happened for everyone in the institution, starting from office staff, security staff, voluntary workers, everyone were trained, lift operators. And that was a very huge task that was done by the infection control team. And the strategies were case identification and the confirmation has already been done. We had to manage the cases that have been transported. We have to communicate the risk appropriately to the community, contact tracing, isolation, and we have to move forward with the strategies. So in that outbreak, we had one index case or one primary case, 18 confirmed cases. And uh, that is 12 male and seven female, four probable cases and range of presentations for encephalitis, ARDS or myocarditis. Only one patient had only mild symptoms with fever, headache, tiredness and cervical adenopathy. 
two survivors, but the survivors had different spectrum. One survivor had myocarditis, encephalitis, ARDS, and dysautonomia, and she was in ICU. And the other survivor had a simple flu-like illness, but both of them were in the, in the hospital till they have confirmed repeatedly negative and uh, their uh, home environment was adequately assured. And then only we shifted them to the home. 2019 outbreak, there was only one patient, 20 year old male, fever, headache, altered sensorium, presented like encephalitis. And system got promptly alerted with the diagnosis, training, setting up an isolation facility, contact tracing, point of care lab. Everything happened there in Kochi and 330 contacts were followed and there were a large number of people trained at that point of time also, 30,000 odd people were trained in this sort of a patient management. And what it made different from 2018 was a point of care lab was set up because what, what is more important in isolation and other strategies is an early diagnosis. And it gave us the uh, uh, importance that preparedness and research in medical emergency, that is a major concern that we need to work on. In 2021, that is during COVID-19 outbreak, when the system had so much stress, a 12-year-old male, high-grade fever, headache, vomiting, altered sensorium, seizures, patient was intubated, and uh, being high-grade fever and refractive seizures without a diagnosis of encephalitis, his X-ray showed infiltrates, CT showed brain edema, point of care ultrasound initially was normal, but later showed myocardial dysfunction. He went on to I know, support, MRI was suggestive, and the diagnosis was made from Nipah viral RNA in blood, bronchiovascular, intertracheal tube, aspirate, CSF, and IgM ELISA in serum. So there were a lot of challenges. The challenges were mainly early identification of suspect contacts with symptoms, previous hospital visit. That is something that we have to be, we have to get in, in such an outbreak with so previous hospital visit. That may be the focus of infection in that patient. Early outbreak detection and diagnosis. Turnaround time is very, very important. Diagnostics laboratories should be available so that we can, strategies can be implemented fast and patient can be quarantined or isolated as appropriate. Lab safety is important, safe practices, sample collection, transportation, and other tests. Implementing infection control practice, on-site capacity building. We might have been trained for various occasions, even in COVID-19. I think if a Nepal-like outbreak comes, we need to have a retraining of everyone so that we'll be actually prepared. If you are adequately trained, we'll be confident to manage these situations. And uniform standard of care for everyone admitted into the ICU safe burial in a dignified manner, psychosocial problems, and long-term follow-up of survivors. So we all know that NIV infection is an RNA virus belonging to Paramyxoviridae. The incubation period is about four to 14 days, and uh, uh, the host is uh, food bats. Presentations are encephalitis and ARDS. These were the previous presentations. But in Calicut outbreak, we have discussed myocarditis as a presentation in an IV infection. And we need to have an action plan, BSL level four lab facilities, infection control practice, isolation, and intent supportive care for the patient. So this is something we all know because in Bangladesh, it was actually the raw palm sap infected by the bat urine and saliva. And in our place, maybe supposed to be partially eaten fruits by the bats or direct contact with the secretions, protective clothing, handling sick animals, avoid those unprotected physical contact with the deceased or infected people, that's especially for healthcare workers and those who are handling the patient to prevent secondary transmission and avoiding exposure to bats and bat secretions. Diagnosis is by real-time RT-PCR, but the more important is we have other infections as well. We have to rule out other causes of fever and investigations in a febrile patient. If we have a limited lab facilities, that is going to be more challenging in situations like this, where there is a high risk of human-to-human -human transmission. So we have to have a RT-PCR and point-of-care micro-PCR assay by TrueNet was set up in Kochi, as well as it was set up in Calicut also in the 2021 outbreak, and viral genome sequencing for phylogenetic analysis and antibody by ELISA. And these tests in 2019 and 2021 were done by National Institute of Virology, Pune, and they were extending their laboratory support, full laboratory support for these studies. Encephalitis has typical characteristic abnormalities 
in MRI, and it's said to have necrotizing vasculitis in seizure formation, vasculitis into strong forces, and also thought of as direct neuronal invasion. So what are the prevention strategies? Food bats of the teropidae family are the natural host. So we have to ensure to avoid exposure to bats and sick animals in endemic areas. Consumption of fruits partially eaten by bats and avoiding drinking raw date palm sap, which is, which is not a practice in our part. And, it, and we have to have a continuous screening for Nipah virus disease among domestic animals. One thing that is different was September 2021 20, outbreak was previous outbreaks we were told that it's, a, it's got a seasonal pattern will happen between December and May with occurrence during winter and spring. That's a breeding season of the bats and it increased virus shedding by the bats. And it, by, bats secrete virus when it is stressed as well. And it's a fruit harvesting season, but uh, uh, the case fatality rate in all the previous outbreak also is 40 to 100 percent. But we were actually surprised to have an outbreak that has happened in September 2021, which we were not expecting. Case definition, this is how happens when we have diagnosed the case. One di case is diagnosed, obviously we have a suspect where we have a person with the classical symptoms of encephalitis, ARDS or myocarditis. Probable where the person has died, but there is definite history of contact that we couldn't make a diagnosis. Such patients will be included in the probable when there is a definite history of contact. And confirmed is obviously confirmation by laboratory tests. And we need to know what is a definition of care contact. It is defined as a patient or a person who came in contact with any case confirmed or probable on at least one of the following that we know that how it has comes into direct contact with the secretions of the patient by handling and uh, this is how we did the risk stratification of contacts in our cases high risk means with body blood or body fluids more than 12 hours close contact and loads home asymptomatic people, but uh, mild touching of suspected touching with clothes and other things. But whether it is high risk or low risk, both of the groups will be in home quarantine for 21 days and they will be shifted to the hospital facility if they develop symptoms. So this was the contact list that took time in the first outbreak and most of the contacts were healthcare workers and about 7% were caregivers. And in last 2021, we had 240 contacts and this was a type of contacts we had. It is from the primary care where the person first went. This is the first hospital. This is the second level. And this is the third and fourth tertiary care center. So depending upon the number of period of time the patient is in the vicinity and depending upon the way the patient interacts with the system, the number of contacts are likely to increase. So we have to tell them and we have to actually educate the patient when they visit the hospital. And this is all the more easier because of the COVID-19 outbreak and all people have used with the uh, mask and other things at present. So all patients coming to the hospital invariably should be encouraged to use a mask. So this is the number of contacts in the 2021 20, uh, outbreak. This is the first, visit, first facility. This is the second hospital. This is the third hospital. And this is the third and patient expired on the 5th of September and the symptoms started from 29th. And the other challenge we faced was triaging of patient. Because triaging is very, very important because all these cases will be coming with fever and they'll be coming to the main emergency department. So we have to have interesting adherence to proper triaging. So we have a patient when it was come diagnosed as fever, what we did was when the patient comes to the ED, we have a uh, quick assessment and then we shift the patient to fever triage. Patient is not actually coming to the main emergency department and into the fever triage patient will be in, in, uh, interrogated about the history and we will see whether the case fit in into the case definition of NIV. And if the case definition of TIPA virus, we put the patient for isolation. And if the patient is seriously ill, will, will be shifted to ICU. And otherwise, patient will be going to the isolation ward. And individual isolation rooms are given to these patients so that even if the patient is negative, turned out to be negative by the test, we can keep the patient safe in a single room. And that way, it is protected that they will not get infection from the vicinity. So this was an uh, article, in fact, we have done to see how the triaging should be done in the emergency department and the patient during COVID era, because COVID comes into the usual ED as well as the COVID 
uh, direct admission to the institution. So we have to be very careful rising from the main emergency department itself. But uh, obviously, we had a major system challenge when the NIPA triage also we have to be set in, we have to set in, in the, uh, the institution during the NIPA outbreak. So we had two, three triages simultaneously running, but NIPA triage patient will definitely come with a uh, contact history or coming from the same area or in the location where the first patient is came. So we were, we were putting a HIPAA triage also during that time in 2021, along with the COVID triage that we had in our institution. Management plan, we should have an investigation panel, should include a well-taken throat swab, nasal swab. We can use primary adjuncts like point of care ultrasound, ABG, ECG, bedside X-ray, and other labs. And MRI brain might give clues to the suspect, but always it is not it, all, it is never an easy task to get an MRI in this situation. Most of the time, it will not happen, especially when we have announced the outbreak in, the in this uh, place. So this was something that has happened. That has an on-site field NIV diagnostic facility, TrueNet RTPCR platform. It has given a faster result. I think it is as fast as 30 minutes. And uh, uh, the mold biodiagnostics, it's uh, devised along with National Institute of Virology. So uh, lab investigations in 2021, we had a lab set up in our own institution, and uh, but it was not a VSL level four as it's uh, needed, but we had done all those cases that do not have classic uh, definite contact history or definite symptoms. We had those done those tests from our own laboratory as well. So this year we had 87 subjects tested Three were repeat sample, and interestingly, all the contacts of the primary case was COVID positive, and there was three patients who had influenza A. So this is the challenge. When we have one illness, it will not come as a, the illness alone. It will be along with other infections. So syndromic presentation, always we have to be alerted, encephalitis, ARDS, with or without myocarditis. And these are the cases that might be coming with such uh, challenging human-to-human -human transmission infection. So we have to be careful about proper isolation care. So always be ready to receive these cases. Never do away with universal precautions. High-risk procedures like intubation, suction, bronchoscopy, nebulization take, we need to take extra precautions and continuous training on infection prevention control for healthcare workers and patient care providers. Management is primarily intense supportive care and we need to use PPA as appropriate, strict adherence to triage and general measures and intensive supportive care is the cornerstone of management. We have to manage the uh, encephalitis part, ARDS part, and myocarditis. We know that there is no drug or vaccine that targets Nipah virus for the time being, but we have a guideline uploaded during that time in uh, DHS of Kerala site. It gives us a guidance how to go about, and we need to manage those patients with encephalitis, myocarditis, and ARDS as the usual way we manage in any other infection. And uh, we have also had a treatment algorithm. If a patient is confirmed NIPA, there was a provision for monoclonal antibody 102.8 that has come at that point of time with us. Both during uh, Calicut outbreak and Kochi outbreak, monoclonal antibody was available to us. And it was planned as a uh, administration as compassionate term. So we have the preparation for the consenting standard operating procedures and the protocols were in place, but we have not used it. And in last year, 2018, we were giving rebavirin, but in 2021, we had other antivirals, remdesivir and favipravir were available to us, but we have not initiated except in one patient as a post-exposure treatment prophylaxis. So monoclonal antibody 102.4 was considered on compassionate grounds. Remdesivir, as the, almost the same dose as we do in COVID-19. Paviparavir is also available in 2021 outbreak, but what we had in 2018 was only ribavirin. And the dose we know, two grams stat, one gram six hourly for four days and 500 milligram six hourly for five days. And we have empirically tried in six patients in 2018. 
among six uh, two survived one was a milder disease the other one was a severe disease but they cannot can make any conclusion based on this uh, management monoclonal antibody appears to block the receptor binding site on the protein preventing adhesion to the ephrin b2 protein and prevents viral entry to the host cell and this was available but was not used at that point of time but now we know that after covid-19 we are all very much familiar about using monoclonal antibodies and we are in a experience in monoclonal antibody in patients during the initial period of the covid-19 so this m102.4 is the monoclonal antibody for covid nipa which was used in hendra virus and it has some phase 1 studies and some healthy volunteers were also received and it is it was imported from queensland australia for treatment of niv infected patients on compassionate ground the requirement for cold chain storage and the intravenous route of administration were the challenges identified for this and we have prepared sop guidelines and consent form this was done along with the niv pune team and our, our institutional pharmacology pharma, pharmacy departments so this is what something i have been discussing about so we need to have a high index of suspicion appropriate lab tests and diagnosis declaration of outbreak and plan action plan line listing shifting of symptomatic to the isolation facility quarantine for 21 days and uh, we need to ensure psychosocial support investigate symptomatics and uh, provide management daily reviews planning and other, with all other departments source identification bat survey false messages is always a challenge especially the social media is so active on those days and we have to be very transparent in the communication with the public as well and we need to give proper support of the family so this is what we have been doing in all the three outbreaks and this is something i have already discussed and we discharge them once they are negative for uh, two tests for first test and then we have already done a repeat test and they are totally symptom free and uh, healthcare providers also were actually uh, monitored for fevers and they were asked to report if there is any symptoms and all contacts were asked to go for uh, quarantine for a period of 21 days from exposure they, and they have to given six sick leaves other important thing that was more challenging in 2018 uh, but we covid 19 we have adopted to the system to a larger extent and it is our responsibility to give safe and dignified burial as uh, this was done and at that point of time also dr gogo umar was our cooperation doctor medical officer psychosocial impacts we have analyzed two, two we have done two studies one was a qualitative study on the psychosocial impacts of nipa survivors and uh, uh, that has actually given the traumatizing effects of those patients survived stigma in the society psychosocial sequelae public mistrust confusion and patient uh, even after we have survived those outbreak public view was the nipa fever was not existent agony of the family with regard to the burial process many things were listed in this and we also have seen uh, an observation study on people kept in isolation facility and people were actually confused at that point of time why they were kept in isolation and most of them in spite of our efforts they were felt that they were not given proper instructions to be followed and they told they are going to die of for nipa even those in quarantine and the, those in isolation with mild symptoms were actually fearing that they are going to die so that sort of things we have to address and long term circular is already being listed in previous studies and we had we have three survivors two of them are doing well but one had some sequelae of the uh, encephalitis part but he is being followed up and most challenging situation is we are moving through many infections so we have to put a long list of differential diagnosis and that is the major challenge i am seeing in the way forward and we have also listed the emergency medicine uh, presentations because we need to understand them when we have to suspect this sort of outbreak but it is nothing uh, different it is almost same like any other viral encephalitis but in calicut experience this was listed because uh, previous outbreaks did not say about 
uh, myocarditis. They were saying about ARDS and encephalitis, but we had five patients presented with myocarditis. Uh, one was with a long encephalitis, one was with ARDS, and three were along with encephalitis and ARDS. Two NIV clades we know, one is Bangladesh type and the other one is the Malaysia or Cambodia M genotype. And uh, uh, what happened in this phylogenetic analysis in 2018, they were sequencing from four human and three fruit bat. And uh, human was 96.15% similar to Bangladesh strain and fruit was, bat was 997 to 100% similar to the uh, this was similar to the Teropus species bat that was done from this place. So they concluded that after bat survey, bats were the source of the outbreak at 2018. 2019 also, they could track the source of infection in the Teropus bats in that area, throat and rectal swabs for NIV RNA. But in uh, the zero survey of bat population in 20. Uh, 19, we, we could prove that there is positive in NIV RNA in the bats at that area. And also environment samples were also done in 2018. Around 60 samples were done, but there were a lot of challenges, rain and other things, but none of the samples detected the NIV RNA or uh, viral uh, detected by real-time RT-PCR. So this is something very interesting. This is recently published and maybe this idea, the architecture of the NIVG tetrama may help us in identifying, implementing multi-pronged therapeutic strategies, uh, both for the uh, management like diagnostic uh, molecule as well as a vaccine, candidate vaccines. So we need to prepare, we prepare for NIPA or pathogen X. So we have to have a point of care testing for rapid screening we should be adequately trained in contact tracing, proactive quarantine of suspected cases, and we must be prepared for research because emergency situations, we have to be have a preparedness well in advance, then only we will be able to implement when a real scenario comes. And always we need to have an animal surveillance so that we will be alerted for early outbreak. So I've been trying to take you through or rush you through what has happened in 2018, 2019 and 2021 in Kerala because I have been part of this team and it is a big teamwork of Nipah outbreak in Kerala, usual and unusual presentation of an uncommon illness with the potential to spread to healthcare providers in close contact with high mortality. Adapt infection control practices should be continued always in future and a long fight cannot stop a biological disaster and team work is the more important thing. And way forward, we are living in an era of international travel and world has become narrowed to a global village. So we have started talking about One Health approach in large and new information, new research and moving together for Q cancers, especially in emergency situations is uh, something we have to do it. And it was a very big team from 2018, 2019 and 2021. We were closely working together and I put all the references, uh, most of the things are we have done, but some we have not yet done. We have to put it in print so that uh, we can prepare for future outbreak as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for the fantastic talk, which uh, provided a great overview of uh, the entire uh, Nipah outbreaks in Kerala. Uh, of course, we do have uh, a number of questions now. And of course, this is something that is of great interest to people, not just in Kerala, but also uh, across uh, the country. Uh, the first question is, when the first patient in Kerala and India presented, nip, nip, presented with Nipah symptoms, how did the clinicians come to know that it was Nipah? Were doctors in Kerala aware of the initial uh, Malaysia outbreak and know about the best practices and standard of care? Uh, first case when it came, uh, in fact, uh, we have not identified the first case. First case died on May 5th and when the cluster happened. First case we have diagnosed as a viral encephalitis uh, in May 5th. And, but uh, after two weeks, the whole family came to the institution. Three of the family members came. Then, then that gave us the uh, true suspicion and the treating doctor actually suspected Nipah because this happens only in very few situations. Cluster of 
violent hepatitis. That is why the suspicion was came up, and it was actually diagnosed by the treating clinician as a, uh, not exactly NIPA, but NIPA like where it happens in violent hepatitis. So it was one of the diagnostic possibilities. And uh, regarding the infection control practices, I think that was the second half. Yeah, yeah that's right. Infection control practices in 2018 was, uh, I don't think we were so very familiar about an illness with the human to human transmission. Uh, because we we are always uh, handling and dealing with patients very closely because we are way more comfortable by interacting with the patient, getting in detail from the patient history and other things and examinations. Maybe the usual mask, two layer or three layer mask and usual practices, gloves and mask was used, but not the N95 mask. That was not a routine practice at that point of time. But it has changed after uh, COVID-19. We have changed a lot, but uh, we have to think in terms of a period before COVID. It was in 2018. But uh, luckily, once we got the information that it is NIPA, and we have made the confirmation by the test, and we have started isolating the patients, uh, those who are symptomatic, and those who are asymptomatic uh, were closely followed up in the quarantine facility for fever. Uh, no new cases were diagnosed after we confirmed the diagnosis. Uh, I don't know whether it was because of our infection control practice or because of the natural history of the illness, but that is, luckily that has happened. Right. The second question is, what is the role of uh, raw date SAP in, in the spread of NIPA? SAP. Yeah, SAP. SAP, uh, it's, it's actually the practice in Bangladesh. And there are many studies in Bangladesh, I think infrared rays and how the batch urine falls into the pot and other things, many things they have done. And they have, uh, more or less, they have proved that the batch urine infected uh, sap with batch urine or saliva, because sal bat also drinks this sap, it seems. Right. And uh, that is the reason why the sap is getting infected with the virus. And uh, this is a usual practice in Bangladesh. And uh, they, they were telling that it's very difficult to curtail that practice because it is so firmly uh, rooted in their culture. Uh, but it is not the practice in Kerala, and I don't think we have ever suspected SAP as a reason in the Kerala outbreak. Uh, now, there's a recent report uh, from NIV which suggests that a significant number of bad samples uh, were zero positive uh, for Nipah virus in and around uh, the region where the outbreaks happened. Now, how does it really impact uh, the, the future outbreaks of Nipah virus and, and what can be done uh, to, to prevent? The most uh, recent report says that antibodies are detected, uh, IgG. Uh, uh, well, it's, uh, but uh, in 2019 and 2018, there were actually NIV RNA was, uh, virus was detected from the bats. So definitely it is there in bats. And I think bats harbor too many viruses. I don't know the, exactly the number. And bats have their own ways of uh, uh, not developing the disease also. I don't know, maybe because of their immune system or other things. Many things are taught talked of that batch never become symptomatic that's what uh, we feel i don't know <laughs> but whatever it is uh, we what we can say is we cannot bats are also said to be very very essential for the ecosystem so we cannot kill bats but uh, what we can do is we cannot disturb their habitat as far as possible and uh, whenever we move to a new place uh, act, what happens is we cut the trees and uh, make them so restless and uh, they have to find where to move on. They, we, actually, we are disturbing their habitat where they're roosting. So those things we have to take care of because they also have the right to live in this world. That is what I feel. We cannot kill bats and uh, remove the disease because they have said to be very, very essential, more than human. That is one report I read. So we have to be very careful about handling bats and especially their very, very areas where they inhabit. And uh, adventurous sports and such things actually making them so stressed. And that is said to be one of the reasons uh, for such outbreaks as well. Uh, and uh, since apart from clinicians, there are also uh, uh, a number of curious citizens uh, who are watching this uh, live shows. Uh, a pertinent question is what can citizens do to, to help early diagnosis, prevent the spread and prevent next outbreak? So this is very, very important question. Uh, one is awareness. 
because though we had uh, two uh, outbreaks, maybe three outbreaks in Kerala, uh, and uh, we have seen the worst of it in 2018, and it was so disturbing, and uh, the system uh, the uh, almost halted for months because of the Nipah, and everything affected, even the economics and social life, everything affected at that point of time. So what we can do is, uh, I think a virus is here among the bats, and we know the important symptoms like uh, ARDS, encephalitis, ARDS, myocarditis. So if the patient comes with fever, the least says it is a per, per public people can do is, whenever somebody is ill, don't go and visit them unnecessarily. First and foremost, avoid unnecessary hospital visits, visiting the sick people. And always uh, where a person is sick, I think we should continue the practice of using masks. And hospital visits. Earlier, we used to think that uh, sick people go to hospital. But uh, very healthy people, when they go to a hospital where there's such illness is happening, they're creating the crowd. And if, uh, if an outbreak happens, it's unnecessarily spreading in the uh, community. So, and uh, when the clustering happens, more people affected with a similar illness. That's how we detect all the epidemics or outbreaks. So similar clustering, especially family members are affected with fever and altered sensorium headache. All such things, they can alert the system and we can do the appropriate testing and more laboratory facilities are available. We can do an early testing and early identification. And even if we don't get the result, uh, because now obviously when an outbreak comes with the first case, it is impossible to diagnose. We have to be very, very fortunate to diagnose with the first case before it is being transmitted. But we have to be very careful in containment. This is more important after COVID-19. Avoid unnecessary hospital visits, avoid overcrowding, and always use a mask if you are sick and if you are visiting a hospital premises. So, and our hand hygiene and other things, it's, we are emphasizing all the more. Thank you very much. And uh, there is one more last question that we could take, and that is on if you could touch upon the efforts on vaccines for Nipah virus, which are underway. Vaccine is, I think, the CEPI and other uh, uh, organizations. And, and there's a huge effort on ident identifying a candidate vaccine and many researchers. Uh, many trials are on the way, maybe five or more are on the way. And uh, definitely people are working on it. But the problem, uh, I don't know whether how long, how, how we are going to implement it whom we will give the vaccine. So those, these are the challenging areas that we are going to uh, face. I don't know whether the vaccine will be effective at post-exposure. So all those things, whom we will give, whether the people going to the forest, whether the people living near to the forest, and all those issues are going to be real challenges. And I think it's going to be a question when we run a clinical trial also on vaccine in the real world. If it's a, you do a phase two or phase three trial, we have to identify whom we are going to vaccinate and what we are going to monitor and illness that comes once very rarely. So this is a major challenge and that is going to be a big challenge as well. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that is uh, all the questions uh, and I'm sure this was a very, very enlightening session and a quite interesting and intriguing session because a lot of people uh, would want to know uh, the, the story of how it was found, how it was treated, uh, because of course there's a lot that has been written about it. Uh, a lot has come in in movies, uh, but of course to hear it from the person who has been in the thick and thin of things is of course uh, the best part of it. Um, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Madam, for this very enlightening session. And before I close, uh, we do have uh, our next session. Uh, and our next session would be taken by uh, Dr. Rajiv Devan, who would talk about the infections, breakthroughs, and boosters. What does the evidence say? So hope to have you back on 8th May uh, at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>